Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I am Donna Bach the Boone County, at the Boone County Public Library. I'm the Public Service Director here. And we, in partnership with the Kenton and Campbell County Libraries and the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement, form the Northern Kentucky Forum. This organization exists to promote civil, civic conversations in our community. So this morning's event um, is actually the second in a series from the forum and that we are doing that addresses housing and homelessness in our region. Now, if you missed the first event on school support for teens experiencing homelessness, you can find it on our website, nkyforum.org. Today's event focuses on affordable housing. We will explore the current issues surrounding our housing situation in Northern Kentucky and hopefully discuss some potential solutions. Uh, so before we jump into our topic today, I'd like to take a moment to thank Norse Media. Uh, this is our team that's here this morning um, that involves NKU electronic media and broadcast students. Um, they are providing the recording and supporting the virtual components of our event today. Thank you, Norse Media. Um, now, we do plan to have time towards the end of our discussion today for some Q&A. Um, if you are joining us virtually, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature on your screen. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests this morning. Um, on our panel today, we have Corey Eimer, the Associate Director of Workforce Development with the Northern Kentucky Area Development District. We have Mr. David Mackleys, uh, the Research Director for BNKY. And we have our Campbell County Judge Executive, Steve Pendry. Welcome, gentlemen. All right, so to get us started, let's go ahead and start here with you, Corey. Um, tell us a bit more about your role in the community and how you're involved in the issue of housing. Sure. Well, first of all, good to be here. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say on the day before Veterans Day, thank you to all the veterans out there, uh, those who have served and those who are serving. Uh, we really appreciate you. Um, as Donna said, my name is Corey Eimer. I'm the uh, Workforce Director for the Northern Kentucky Workforce Investment Board and the Associate Director at the uh, Area Development District for Workforce Development. Um, this housing affordability study uh, really started at the Workforce Development and it started at, at, at the Northern Kentucky Area Development District. I'm sorry. It started as a workforce conversation. Uh, my predecessor, Tara Johnson Nome, uh, was really at the forefront of the study recognizing that housing really is a workforce issue. She is now the executive director of the Area Development District. And so she led the study um, really from the, from the beginning in partnership with fiscal courts and CBG Air, Airport uh, that provided the funding. Uh, so the ad has really been the, the facilitator, connector, and resource provider for this study. And we're happy to see it come to fruition and to be able to really uh, put wheels on this to really have the community take some action around this. So we're happy to be involved and uh, happy to have this conversation today. Uh, good morning. Uh, so I'm David McAleese, Research Director at BNKY Growth Partnership. Uh, we are the regional economic development company for Boone, Kitten, and Campbell counties. Uh, we seek to really promote uh, opportunity and prosperity for all Northern Kentuckians through the creation of good paying jobs. Uh, our primary objective is uh, attracting new business and investment in the region, uh, as well as uh, retaining our existing uh, employment base. Uh, as research director, uh, I support these efforts, uh, along with you know, monitoring uh, the labor market landscape, the economic base uh, of the community. Um, no question, housing availability and affordability is a complex issue. Uh, but one that's becoming increasingly important to uh, corporate site selection decisions. Uh, a prominent site selection consultant in our industry uh, in a presentation earlier this year um, said that, you know, in terms of, of trends in site selection, housing is the new workforce uh, issue. And, and, you know, what they really meant was, um, you know, as companies are looking to make investment and site decisions in where they're locating their operations, the need for housing is becoming top of mind for them. 
um, you know, certainly as they consider things like population and labor force growth, we need that sufficient housing supply to accommodate that. Um, and not to mention, um, you know, from a health per, uh, perspective, you know, housing being one of those social determinants uh, of health, uh, it becomes very important uh, to, to our community. So um, housing really has become a, a huge topic All right, my name is Steve Henry. I'm what's called a judge executive, and many of you know that judge executives are required to do certain things by law, and just about everything else that somebody might complain about, uh, we hear about and are expected to do something about also. Uh, but those are fun things most of the time, and uh, workforce and housing probably falls into that category. There's probably no specific uh, requirement that we deal with it, but uh, we all work together across northern Kentucky this subject matter has been dealt with now by the three uh, judge executives at uh, Campbell, Kenton, and Boone, along with another five judge executives uh, that populate the Ad District. Um, our key observation is there aren't enough workers out there. And uh, as we all learned over, over time, this was not just a COVID-related issue. Uh, there's a demographic problem that's very real. Uh, as part of the study that we're going to talk about today, a couple of observations were made about our local population. Uh, there are fewer and fewer people uh, enrolled as undergraduates in college across the country and also in our schools. There are fewer people enrolled in grade school and those are our workforce uh, problems for the future. There are fewer people to do the work because they were never born. The requirement is it's not going to be met. I'm looking around the room, there are a lot of you that are going to do something about that, so we'll have to try something other than having larger families. <laughs> and though I'm willing, I fall into that category too. So, um, thus the judge executives had a uh, problem uh, put before them uh, in cooperation with the ad and people like uh, BNKY, um, there was a study done that sort of surveyed of all the things the community is doing around workforce uh, to see whether there were things more efficient that could be tried. And, uh, and that study uh, provided a, sort of the rationale for a further conversation because it exposed all this demographic information that I'm talking about. Um, it's not a matter of people spending too much time on, on the couch after COVID, and it's not a matter of coaxing them back into the workforce. I mean, there's some of that, but the bottom line is that there are not enough people, and that we're going to have to work smarter and, uh, and attract people into our area, and we can't do that if they don't have a place to live. So the very next thing that logically follows from our observations about workforce is we have to get into the discussion about housing. That's, uh, Affordable is a word that conjures all sorts of political uh, thoughts. Um, better to say workforce housing because of the house, after all, is a place where the job goes to sleep. And that's not original with me. I'm, I'm really original about anything. A few different things I'll wind up saying that it's somebody else's idea. So, enough about that. On with the show. <laughs> Well, and uh, thank you, Steve. I'm going to come back to just really quick. Um, you know, it is a connotation that when people hear the word affordable housing, they often think of government subsidized housing. Um, but that's not entirely what we're talking about, right? So um, you, I think Corey as well, share with us, you know, what do you mean exactly when you say workforce housing? Is there anything else you'd like to add about that definition? Sure, I, I, I'd be happy to. So, uh, as Judge said, sometimes the, the term affordable housing can have a negative uh, connotation. Well, maybe you don't know who said that. Um, what we are really in search of is income aligned housing. Uh, affordability is relative. Um, and when we're talking about workforce housing, what we're really talking about is housing that is available and accessible to the moderately income population. Uh, so we're talking about 80 to 120% AMI, uh, area median income. 
uh, which in our region uh, amounts to about thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year if you're a single person in a household, sixty to one hundred thousand for a two wage earner. So it's really not the low, you know, Section Eight subsidized housing that we're talking about. Certainly, there is a need for that. We've seen that as well. Um, but out of the you know roughly sixty over 6,000 units that we're going to need over the next five years, I think about 500 are recommended to be of the lower income uh, category. Really, we're talking about those the houses that are uh, accessible to someone who has a moderate income. Okay, uh, just some preliminaries here. That there, there was a study commission that, that uh, from eight counties, plus the airport, paid for it. And the idea was to establish a baseline on housing across North Kentucky that um, would, would serve uh, as, well, you know, the, the information we need to conduct an intelligent conversation. Uh, there, there weren't conclusions necessarily drawn, but it's, it's apparent from the elements of the uh, reporting, uh, what we need to work on, and one of the principal conclusions was that uh, for a variety of reasons we have an oversupply or an adequate supply of three and four bedroom homes and a, a, a dearth of uh, apartments and one and two bedroom homes in our community. I say there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, there are people in the audience who could give a history lesson on this, but there, there once was a financial crisis in the late aughts in the late 2000s that drove a lot of builders out of business and, and I think probably naturally uh, there was a retreat to uh, building things that uh, were in the highest demand and probably produced a, a better profit but also were less risky for those reasons and there also weren't as many builders still in business to provide a broad spectrum of housing. So we've got an imbalance that's resulted over the years for that and, and many other reasons uh, that needs to be addressed in the future. And, uh, and since you mentioned this number of 6,500 additional housing units, I want to point out that that's not a scary number. We're not going to be developing every vacant lot in Northern Kentucky to try to achieve it. It's not that much different from the, uh, the outlook that you expect over the next five years anyway, but what we're hoping to do is uh, build an awareness that there needs to be this rebalancing uh, going on in order to serve a certain population that we need to populate our industries and, uh, and get uh, a different mix of housing stock built. Um, so if I could just add, uh, and piggyback I think on what uh, Judge Henry just said, uh, if you look at residential building permits, uh, and this is really the three county we in Campbell, uh, we, we peaked in our region uh, in the early 2000s. We were roughly 3,000 units per year. Then came the housing crisis, um, and, and now we're at about you know 750 to 1,000 units uh, per year. So that's 6,500 uh, fits generally in, in that ballpark. Um, you know, certainly there's a difference between affordable housing and subsidized housing. Uh, if you look at um, the Housing and Urban Development, the federal agency, they would say, or they would define roughly affordable housing as housing that costs or where the occupants are paying no more than 30% of their gross income, um, including utilities on housing. Um, you know, that, that can encompass a wide swath. If you look at the latest American Community Survey data, 23% of households in our region um, are paying more than 30%, so they are what's considered housing cost burdened. Um, you know, that's not just an urban issue, it's not, you know, it's not just a rural issue, so it really encompasses all areas. Um, and, and so again, I would just say, like, like Corey mentioned, it is aligning the income with housing. Um, you know, it's not just a, a poor or low income challenge. It, it's getting um, housing in line uh, or the cost of housing in line with, with the regional income. Exactly. And Corey, I have heard you use that term income aligned housing 
previously. And that so far, that is the best one that I've heard to really describe what we're looking for um, and where we need to grow. Um, can you talk a little bit, Corey, about how our region's shortage of this kind of housing um, is impacting our workforce right now? Absolutely. So, first of all, we're fortunate in Northern Kentucky, really statewide, to have really good economic development over the last handful of years. Uh, we've had a lot of projects announced, a lot, a lot of new jobs coming to our area, um, which has meant that we currently have about two jobs for every available person. Which if you really think about that, that's a huge challenge for our region. Uh, and part of the part of the issue is a lack of housing. I mean, that's that's risen to the top in terms of as we're unpacking all of the reasons that, that our workforce is as, as it is today, housing is among the top factors. Um, so really, as Judge Pendry said, uh, quoting uh, Greg Colbert, I think, with, you know, uh, uh, a job, a house, is, what is it, a work? A, a job is where I'm done. A house, house is a place. A house is a place where a job is to sleep. Thank you. I'm going to look in front of it. I always screw that up. I'll flip around. <laughs> uh, but it's very true. And, and so, unless we have housing for, you know, thinking about our, our post-secondary uh, institutions in this area, we're rich with colleges and universities, but unless those new graduates have somewhere to live when they graduate, they're not going to graduate and immediately go to a three- and four-bedroom house. Uh, so, you know, about 60% of the need is projected to be one- to two-bedroom units. So we need to, to think about that when we're thinking about attracting new talent and keeping our young talent in this region. Yeah, if, if there were a bigger audience and we asked for a show of hands, uh, and, the, and the question uh, was, how many of you have sons and daughters or, or grandchildren that are having a hard place, uh, or a hard time finding a place to live in Northern Kentucky, there would be hands in here. That's what it comes down to. This is, this is not social engineering. This, this is finding places for our future workforce to work. And, and while we're on the subject, this demographic thing is uh, difficult enough that we're actually going to need everybody. Everybody is important in the future and for the future of the country where the workforce is concerned. And whatever their economic strata, whatever their educational background, we, we've got to get everybody polished up and uh, working responsibly towards getting and holding the job or you know, we're getting a big problems. Yeah, and I think even if you asked even our small audience today, you probably yes, see the hands go up to that question. You're 100 percent right. Um, and this is for anybody else on the panel as well. Um, do you have anything to add about why all Northern Kentucky citizens should be concerned about this? Um, you know, I would just say um, you know, first to quote, uh, you know, the stat that comes directly from the study, there are 2.68 workforce jobs for each housing unit they can afford today. Um, and, and so with that, when you think of workforce housing, yes, it's your typical warehouse jobs, it's your temp jobs, but it's also your teachers, your police, your firefighters. Um, you know, the study defines workforce um, jobs as those making below 60000 a year. Uh, which makes sense because our average wage in the region is roughly 55,000. Um, you know, these are essential workers in our community that need to be able to um, find places to live. Um, and and when, when families, when households are unable to afford houses close to their place of employment, that pushes them further and further away. Uh, it's certainly decreasing their quality of life. Um, and then certainly, you know, talent attraction being a key uh, if we want to bring people into the area as well as retain our younger people, we need to make sure that there's, there's a place uh, where they can afford a place to live. David, have you heard concerns about adequate housing from for workers from prospective businesses that are considering in Kentucky? Um, you know, good question. Um, you know, I would, I would put it more in terms of quality of life is becoming a top of mind issue uh, in corporate site selection. Uh, and that includes everything from you know, regional amenities all the way to cost of living. Um, and, and cost of living has traditionally been one of the selling points that we've been able to say. Um, but you know, certainly with inflation,
inflation, and I know inflation is top of mind, um, that you know, it, it is it is definitely uh, made our region less competitive. It has certainly put upward pressure on housing prices. Um, you know, when you talk about you know what are companies looking for? Yes, workforce top of mind, um, and making sure that there are uh, a sufficient supply of housing for that workforce uh, is something that, that uh, companies and their corporate site selection and uh, making those decisions are are thinking. So we touched on this a little bit um, with your response, David, but I wanted to open it up to the panel as well. Um, if you guys can describe um, how this is going to, pack, going to impact other services throughout the North Carolina region, things like education, we talked a little bit about that, um, but hospitals, social services, transportation is another big issue in this region. Well, first of all, healthcare is one of our, our biggest sectors. Uh, there's logistics and warehousing and healthcare in Northern Kentucky that are, the, that are the top two. And as we see a shrinking, not necessarily a shrinking population, but our job growth is out, outpacing our population. And that is definitely going to affect our healthcare system. Uh, right now we're, we're struggling mightily to get nurses into the, into the workforce pipeline. As David said, we're talking about income aligned housing. That drastically affects our educators. We need more teachers in the pipeline. Um, so there's no doubt that, uh, you know, and in schools, I mean, our post-secondary partners will tell you that um, enrollment has been declining uh, pretty steadily. So how do we get, uh, get more students in? Uh, it goes back to what Judge Mentor said in the beginning. There, these folks aren't being born. So, uh, if you think about our labor market and how it has shifted over, over the course of time, usually over 8 or 12 years, it goes from a job seeker market to an employer market and, and back and forth. Um, and I don't see that changing anytime soon unless we get a massive injection of, of people into our population. And um, not to get us too far off topic, but I think we, we need to think about immigration too and how we embrace that. Because 90% of, of all of our population growth is going to be uh, from immigration. So how do we how do we embrace that and uh, really really capitalize on that? And then it was mentioned, and this is this is a PMKY sort of thing that uh, quality of life is the thing that the businesses considering moving to our area are most concerned with. How high quality is your life going to be? nurses at the hospital when you drop by for an outpatient or God forbid an inpatient thing. Uh, what's it going to be like if uh, the restaurants all have restricted hours or you have to wait in line for something that's you know, not so high? <laughs> uh, you can multiply those observations across the, the whole spectrum of, of uh, service in our economy and, and that's what we're going to get. If we can't successfully to attract people into this area, to populate our businesses, and I want to emphasize, we need to attract people into this area to populate the businesses we have now, much less the businesses that we try to attract here, right? Uh, so, you know, the way is clear, and what needs to be done is pretty clear. We, we have to um, have a high quality of life, roll out the red carpet, attract people into the area, and keep them here. If we're going to sustain an economy that uh, supports it. And I think you're always going to have the challenge of weighing growth versus the pressure that it puts on existing services. And, and I can speak for, you know, BNKY, we are trying to attract high paying jobs. Uh, but the reality is you're always going to have uh, more of the, you know, lower, pay, lower wage, you know, the logistics and warehousing has grown organically because of the, where, uh, the, the location of CBG and, and all that. Um, so, so you know, you have to, to provide that balance. You know, interestingly, the study actually pointed out that despite a growth in households in our region over the last five years, or 15, 2015 to 2020, there's actually been a modest decline in public school enrollment. 
And, and again, I think that speaks to, again, a uh, lack of, of younger people uh, coming in um, and some of those demographic drivers. But, you know, it's interesting that you can see that um, while it's, it's not as uh, you know, draining necessarily on the, uh, the education system. And I would argue, you know, given the, the choice between the challenges that come with growth versus the challenges that come with stagnating or, or declining, Personally, I would choose and I would advocate for the region the problems that come with growth. <laughs> and, you know, so far, we painted a, a bit of a bleak picture <laughs> of the state that we're in. Um, and I'd like to ask you, Steve, from a, a political and a policy standpoint, what are the obstacles that we have to building the levels of income aligned housing that we need? Well, the first thing I can tell you is this whole thing needs to be demystified a little bit. And needs to be a positive discussion about a bright future instead of, uh, you know, triggering uh, the not in my backyard sort of reaction from the public. I mean, they're used to thinking of, of uh, affordable housing in a certain way, and they want to, want to protect uh, what they've managed to accumulate themselves and have people surrounding them that they're comfortable with, and income levels that uh, lift everybody, and all that. Um, this is not, this is a completely different subject matter as far as I'm concerned. This is, do you want enough people here to do the jobs that are required to support your quality of life? And if you do, here are the things we're going to have to provide to, to support that. It's, it's our kids, our grandkids, uh, finding place, places to live in our community. It's attracting people into the area to, to populate businesses we already have and the businesses that it's our ambition to attract here. And if we don't do it, uh, it's, things are going to be worse. It's not, you know, there's not really a choice here. It's, it's all happened very naturally, and, and most of what's required to do is going to happen pretty naturally, too. I don't think people are going to notice that um, we just shifted some incentives around to provide um, a little bit more in the way of one and two, two, uh, two bedroom homes and, uh, and apartments. Now, one of the fun things about the study is it talks about all the sort of non-threatening way we got into this mess in the first place. Um, things like in the inner cities, single family homes were divided into apartments uh, years ago and now uh, people are, are buying them and turning them into single family homes. Or as David pointed out, um, the average number of people that populate the unit has dropped, so you need more units to accommodate the same population. Um, there are, well, there are lots of other little details like that that explain why things got out of balance, uh, but we, we need to exert ourselves a little bit to uh, pull things back into shape so that um, we have housing for people who need it protect our future. And I think, and, and Judge, correct me if I'm wrong, on the other side of the coin, you're getting pushback from the development community when you're saying, well, it's it's not financially feasible to build affordable housing uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, interestingly, the, the ad study actually pointed out that our region is one of the least restrictive in terms of development regulations uh, you know, across the country um, when it looks at you know, regulations around housing. Um, so I think part of it, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is is educating the business and development community and, and you know, what's that available for them to provide that type of housing. Well, there is this, and I agree with what you said, but uh, it's, it's only been recently that there was a, a national uh, economist for the, what used to be the Home Builders Association in town. And some of the first things out of this was man's uh, mouth, uh, the things that you want to one of the things I want to emphasize most was the observation that uh, if, if you want to grow in the future, you've got to have uh, affordable housing. And, and I would say workforce housing. And without that, you're not going to grow. So I don't, I don't think we're going to have a problem with the development community and, and the uh, building industry uh, because they're going to see this as a way forward uh, in some respects as well. Uh, but we do have to be out there and explain to people and hold a few hands and, and make some coaching arguments in order to help them. What kind of 
coordination is going on between the counties and the fiscal courts to do some of this work, right? To get out there and educate people. Well, I, I think this is a start. Uh, this has been going on now for, I would say, a couple of years. And, uh, and there's already a pretty growing coalition of people, service providers on the workforce end, uh, economic development people, and the local, uh, local governments. Two studies have been done that, that took time and, and uh, resources to uh, get generated. And we've got the material now uh, that, that we can use to educate, and, and we're doing that. Uh, in Northern Kentucky, Best by cooperating, we, we all uh, get in when we get in together and, uh, and work to solve our problems. I'm, I'm seeing faces around this uh, this audience that are going to help along the way. So um, I'm, I'm not worried that uh, we'll fail to address this, but we, we need to get off on the right right foot. And keep repeating <coughs> some of the same message points. This is not a threat to our way of life. To, to the contrary.
especially in inner city areas like uh, rooms above a detached garage or uh, a separate building on the property. And uh, if, if you make some changes in uh, the regulation, you could rent those out or even sell them. just say that with our aging population, it's not unique to this region, um, we do anticipate that some seniors are going to move, be moving out of their current houses into more shared living spaces. Um, so that there might be an opportunity there to free up some housing stock. Um, the other thing that I might add is, you know, we need to think of our eight county region as our labor shed. Uh, so there are opportunities probably in our more the, the northern parts of our of our outer line counties for some of these housing uh, developments to take place. Uh, and, and of course that brings up the issue of transportation, which we all know is, is another top uh, factor when it comes to uh, the workforce and, and job accessibility. Uh, but you know, it's gonna take there's not a silver bullet. I think there's many things to be considered. Well, we're looking at, uh, at uh, housing uh, creation uh, outside of a 20, 30 minute commute, then we're talking about the need for independent, private, reliable transportation. So it's all interconnected. Uh, I don't have a particular region to point to that's doing it very well, uh, but, I, but I know that every region is unique, so we need to look at our own uh, capacity and, and needs and, and do what we can for Northern there was actually a recent article in, in Rumor um, that was looking at Minneapolis. Um, and, and Minneapolis has actually been the first major metro area uh, to see their annual inflation fall below the, the Fed's 2% uh, target. Uh, and, and they really attribute this to a region-wide push on affordable housing, um, or, or at least addressing rising housing costs. Um, you know, some of the things they did was, was eliminate zoning that only allowed for single family. They invested $320 million since, since 2018 for rental assistance and subsidies. Um, and this really led to more apartments, more condos. Um, you know, they, they, and this is through you know, some nonprofits, um, really, and, and both the public and, and, and private sector. Um, you know, they're pushing for 18,000 new housing units. Um, and, and really where, where the, you know, the article goes on to talk about, you know, there's the expectation that, you know, it's going to lead to all these problems, and, and, and it's really done the opposite. Um, now, you know, the ending is yet to be writ uh, written, but, you know, that's definitely, you know, when you can say, are there examples out there, um, you know, it, it really speaks to how 
focusing on affordability and supply of housing um, can help address and, and, and bring in some of those rising housing costs that we're all seeing. Uh, and I'm going to come to you, Corey, but anyone can, can chime in on this. Um, we are talking about housing, and, and this is a series and a topic we're going to be exploring more through these warm events. But aside from housing, what other issues are you seeing that's impacting the Kentucky's workforce? You're going to have to set a stopwatch on this one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I'll, I'll just highlight there, there are several issues, housing being one, of course, but child care. Uh, I think child care is something that. We at the Workforce Investment Board are lifting up as an area that we want to advocate for. And I'll, I'll say that because it's too pronged. We need um, accessible, high quality child care today to get our people today into the workforce. Statewide, we've got 45,000 people who indicated that child care is the reason that they're not in the workforce making about 130,000 jobs open statewide. 45,000 of those jobs can be filled now if we could just figure out the child care situation. Um, and then the other reason that child care is so critical, high quality child care, is because three-year-old preschoolers today are gonna be our workforce in 15 years. Um, so if we don't get them off to a strong start now, um, you know, we're not gonna be in, in very good shape 15 years down the road. So I think we, we need to think about the long game too. And a big piece of that is um, getting our early childhood educators in the pipeline. You know, I, I will say that I, I know that our educators in general have a, have a hard job, an important job, and they're, in my opinion, uh, underpaid. Uh, that, goes, uh, that goes 10 times for our early childhood educators. If you're, if you're uh, being paid $13 an hour to do a very difficult, hard job working with little kids every day, or you can go up the street and make $17 an hour to work at an easier job, let's say, I think that's an issue for our community. And, and I think we, we need to look more at public-private partnerships to be able to, uh, to do better in that area. I'll stop there. I said I said <laughs> you need to stop watch so. That's all right. It's all good things we should be talking about. Um, and we're going to take this opportunity now to open it up for questions. Um, if anyone here in the audience has a question, simply raise your hand. Um, and if anyone in our virtual audience today has a question, uh, please be sure to type that into the Q&A. I have a question. Uh, Judge Pender, you mentioned incentive developers, and you touched on uh, one topic. Is that something that is uh, aspirational right now, or do you see that going on? I do know from my work with development, it seems communities are a little more um, willing to use incentives, including IRBs, to bring in residents to develop. Well, I'd have to categorize it as aspirational at the moment, but it does occur to you if you've been in the habit of sending commercial projects uh, for very good reasons, uh, we think, that uh, when good reasons pop up to uh, do it on the residential side, that you ought to consider that. So I think all, of, all the local governments will wind up considering it and they don't, there will be movement. Thank you. We have a, a question online um, uh, from Gail. Uh, says, this has been such an informative session. Thank you. Um, she has a great desire to support forward movement in this area. What can an individual do to support the great work that well, we need to multiply her <laughs> <laughs> several thousand probably. I, I think the most important thing, and I think I've tried to weave it in the conversation a few times already, is for people to uh, come away with an impression that I believe is accurate that what we're doing here is what is called for in the circumstances and, and rather than being a threat in their future, it, it's sort of the answer to a problem that is just being recognized. Uh, at the beginning of COVID, everybody understood that there weren't enough workers out there. And, and I think the fact that COVID coincided with that uh, dearth of, of, work, of workers, uh, everybody had it in their minds that uh, if COVID goes away, our 
problem this way, but it was a coincidence, really, that, um, that came about that maybe moved some of the uh, baby boomers to the sidelines a little more swiftly than otherwise would have been the case. But it's a demographic thing. There are the succeeding generations after the baby boomers are not uh, populous enough to replace them. And they're going to be fewer workers for 10, 15 years in the future in all likelihood. So what, what comes from that is it's, it's going to be more of a worker's market. And if you're an employer, you need to keep your people happy and create a culture that looks after their needs so that they'll stay with you. Um, if you're a consumer uh, or you're a member of the general public, you need to know that the world has changed. We have to react if we, uh, we want to succeed. And we're going to have to do things that attract people into our communities uh, if we want to continue orderly, steady, steady growth that assures us of a, a bright future. Yeah, I would just echo that, and, and you know, the best thing I could they could do to help would be, you know, help educating the community, getting the word out. Um, you know, how do you combat nimbyism? Not in my backyard. It's it's, you know, becoming informed. It's it's it's, um, you know, again, this is, you know, what are pop policies going to have to look like going forward? I think regional cooperation is key, and, and, and I think we're lucky to have have that here. Um, we're going to consider multiple strategies. There's not going to be any one, you know, catch-all strategy that's going to fix this challenge. Uh, and it's a multi-pronged approach that, you know, it, it, it's, it's going to be both market rate construction on housing and, um, you know, below market, affordable housing. It's, it's not either or. Um, and, and making sure that our, we as a community understand that, you know, just because we're, we, can we can focus on affordable housing and that does not preclude us from also um, ensuring that the private market I would just say good though, I have nothing to add. <laughs> well, there is one more thing I want to say, and that is the market's going to dictate. Uh, the market's going to dictate, it's far more powerful than any of us can control, but you can give it a nudge here or there. You can uh, offer an incentive here or there, and, and that's really what we need to do. We're not talking about wholesale changes in our lives here. We're talking about giving things a nudge in the right direction, and, and we should get it. <laughs> So we talked a lot about this has been phenomenal, especially in the field of homelessness and housing. That's what ends homelessness is, is housing that is income aligned and wage-based housing. And you know, with a third of the population that we're seeing at the shelter show up over the age of 55, there's been a lot of discussion about wage-based housing for workers and workforce development. You know, is there going to also be a, a, a pronged approach for senior housing that is in line with what their fixed income is in our community? Because we see that a lot you know, of the thousand folks we saw, a third of those were over the age of 55. Yeah, I think that, that's the way, one of the ways forward is to provide um, housing for seniors. If they're, if they're in a big house, their kids have moved out, they're looking for a place that's uh, less trouble with take care of, closer to the hospital, whatever it might be. Um, when they move into housing like that, which threatens no one when it's built, right? When they move, move, then the house they left behind is housing for somebody else. And you get a migration pattern going uh, among the housing, different types of housing stock that is going to help solve our problem. It's a really been a conundrum for folks because they don't want to go to long-term care. They're not ready for that but there's really no stock and no solution that is for a senior that has accessibility, you know, and all those quality of life amenities around them. Thanks. That's excellent. I'd just like to make an observation, if that's okay. I'm here on behalf of the um, Greater Cincinnati and Kentucky Apartment Association. And uh, when Mark Nykirk and I were young journalists back in the 80s, if you talked about building an apartment complex around here, you were going to get a fight. It went on for years. Judge, to your point, I, I've seen a complete sea change of that. Um, one of the big developers, uh, apartment developers, is called BRG. They built down here at Arrow Parkway in Route 18 a uh, very nice apartment complex uh, community. 
Um, they call it attainable housing. If, if you work across the street and make $20, $23 an hour, you can afford a nice two-bedroom apartment. After that broke ground, Gary Moore, the judge executive, invited me and the CEO of that and said, we want more. So they, this was about 18 months ago. They just cut the ribbon on one down by an Eber, and they're building another on Graves Road. So I've seen, and I've seen it in Campbell County, I've seen it in all three counties, much more of a willingness by the, the policymakers and the electeds uh, and the planners to you know, take this into consideration. They're not throwing them everywhere, but they are much more open to working with people. So uh, to me, it's, a, it's an encouraging term. I actually have a question. <laughs> um, you know, something that you know, I think the library realm we're exploring and talking about, and I think Courtney touched on a little bit with public uh, private partnerships um, and thinking about some of our um, aging population. Um, have you guys seen models or do you know of work that's happening to co locate uh, businesses or services with housing? Well, that's going to be a uh, that's going to be an issue that needs to be tackled uh, in the uh, planning and zoning realm comprehensive plan reviews that we're talking about because in the uh, in the planner's mind in the old days those needed to be separated and uh, the documentation and the, and the planning uh, process needs to be changed and, and I think it will be adjusted. Yeah I think what you're referring to there is mixed use mm -hmm. and, and this idea that you can bring in commercial and residential and that you can, can work together harmoniously. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that going together, tying that into transit hubs again. You know, where where are those those major tank stops in our community so that you're not as reliant on a personal vehicle? Um, and, and I think there'll be opportunity, more opportunity for that uh, going forward. I mean, let's be frank, and, and really the study pointed to we have plenty of single-family, three and four-bedroom homes. Um, probably don't need a ton more of that. We need it. it buzzword here is, is the missing middle. Um, and again, a lot of communities are, are seeing this missing middle. And, and what is that? That's multi-unit buildings that are typically in more walkable uh, neighborhoods. They're connected to job hubs. They're connected to community resources. Um, and I think that goes back to that quality of life, that amenity um, that more and more people are starting to, to look for. You know, you think about our aging population um, that you know, we're, so they don't have to go too far for those key services. And I think we can look at what the city of Covington is doing right now with the former IRS site. I mean, my understanding is that's going to be a mixed use, some some uh, commercial, some residential right there. So I would expect that we will probably see more of that. All right, well, we're coming close here to the end of our time. Um, any final thoughts from either of you that we'd like to address before we go? But well, we could say that a lot of what we're talking about is based on study documents. Uh, and there's there's just a wealth of information in there that uh, can put people's minds at ease, can inform public discussion, and, uh, and result in better outcomes if, if we all read it. Thank you guys so much. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you guys